And you are muted, Dr. Tao. <laughs> All right. It is six o'clock in the evening, and I'm sure everybody on this call has had a long day as well. Um, welcome. We're very happy that you are joining us this evening. It looks like we have about 30 attendees so far. So that's a great turnout, and we're really pleased to see that. So thank you for the, taking the time to be with us. My name is Dr. Elena Tahao. I'm the Director of Curriculum and Instruction. And um, also here tonight is uh, Dr. Dr. Probert, the junior senior high school principal. And we have school counselors, um, um, Ms. Thurman and Mrs. Less. And this evening we're going to share with you um, some information that um, is probably new to you about the new uh, state graduation requirements. So I can't promise a real uh, exciting, entertaining show this evening but it is going to be lots of good information that is important for you and your student to be aware of. And uh, we wanna make sure that you have this information. Uh, throughout the, this, this evening's uh, presentation, uh, feel free to type any questions that you may have in the chat. I'll be monitoring the chat and make sure your questions get answered. And we also will be pausing throughout for an opportunity to ask questions. Um, if you would like to, to ask a question, you can raise your hand and I'll go ahead and unmute you um, during those um, question times or even, even throughout the session. So I'll be keeping an eye on that. And at this time, I'm gonna turn things over to um, uh, Dr. John Proper, our esteemed junior senior high school principal. Dr. Proper. Thank you. I don't know about esteemed, but I appreciate uh, the introduction. Um, I'm actually going to, to, I'm going to stop my video and, and you just have to listen to my voice uh, as we go through the slides here. But I have a lot of information uh, for you all this evening, um, talking about the pathways to graduation. Um, our agenda this evening, I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time talking about um, Act 158. Uh, which I'll explain uh, in, in greater detail in just a moment. And then we're gonna get to the college and career readiness uh, piece uh, towards the end of this presentation. But uh, for now, if you just follow along with me as, as, as we go, and again, this whole presentation will be, uh, is being recorded. So we'll be able to put this back up because there's so much information. It's very information rich. Um, we're gonna put this out on the website for everyone to be able to access uh, at some point. So. Appreciate your attendance tonight. Um, once again, it's a great turnout. We have 41 participants thus far, uh, and I'm sure there'll be more that will be stopping through. So I'm gonna stop my video and uh, we're gonna get rolling. All right, so uh, this evening, as, as I mentioned, wanted to get into the nuts and bolts of the Pennsylvania Department of Education's Act 158. Um, we, it's the, the pathways to graduation and it, and it really begins with the class of 2023, our current juniors, and obviously the, the classes beyond that. So as you may already know, the, the Pennsylvania Department of Education requires all students to take three keystone exams prior to graduation. Uh, the exams are course specific and include Algebra 1 in grades 8 or 9, Biology in grades 9 or 10, and Literature in grade 10. Originally, the state wanted to make passing all three Keystone exams a graduation requirement. What resulted was ultimately Act 158 of 2018. Act 158 provides alternatives to Pennsylvania's statewide requirement of attaining proficiency on the three end of course keystone exams that I just mentioned in order for a student to achieve statewide graduation requirements. Effective with the graduating class of 2023, students have the option to demonstrate post-secondary preparedness through one of four additional pathways that more fully illustrate college, career, and community readiness. Keystone exams will continue as the statewide assessment Pennsylvania uses to comply with accountability requirements uh, set forth in the federal uh, ESSA legislation, which is Every Student Succeeds Act. That's kind of the legislation that, that uh, came after the No Child Left Behind Act. And all, although students will no longer be required to achieve proficiency on the Keystone exams in order to meet statewide graduation requirements, students must take the Keystone exams for purposes of federal accountability, which means that 
Uh, failure for our students to do so will affect us as an organization and our school's participation rate. So obviously that's something that, that is obviously important. So for students graduating in 2023 and beyond, there are five pathways that exist for meeting school graduation requirements. The one that I had already mentioned about Keystone proficiency, which I'll, I'll speak about in a, in a moment. Keystone composite, career and technical education concentrator, alternative assessment, and evidence-based. So let's talk about the, the, the easiest way. Um, the, this is the least complicated way to meet the state graduation requirements, the Keystone Proficiency Pathway. Keystone exams are course specific exams. Students take Keystone exams in the spring at the end of the course connected to the Keystone exam. For example, a student will take the Algebra 1 Keystone exam in the spring during the year that the student takes Algebra 1. That is typically in the spring of their eighth grade year or their ninth grade. If your student is not proficient or advanced, they have the option of retaking the exam in the winter and or again the following spring. This provides students with multiple attempts at earning proficient or advanced. However, the further away a student is from the original course content, sometimes the more difficult it is to improve the Keystone exam score. So that's why we really feel it's important that you encourage your student to take the Keystone exams very seriously and try their best. The second pathway is the Keystone Composite Pathway. The Keystone Composite Pathway is an alternate to scoring proficient or advanced on all three Keystone exams. This pathway requires students to be proficient or advanced on at least one of the Keystone exams. If the student scores basic on two Keystone exams and proficient on one, then the composite score, or all of the scores added together, must be at least 4452 in order to, to meet state graduation requirements. Okay, that's the, that's the magic number listed there, 4452. It is possible that a student can be proficient on one exam and basic on the other two, but if the proficiency score and basic scores are low, then they might not meet the required composite score. This pathway will also work for students who score proficient or advanced on two Keystone exams and basic on the third. Let's talk about the third way. The third pathway to graduation is that career and technical education concentrator pathway. If your student does not meet the state graduation requirements via the Keystone Proficiency Pathway or the Keystone Composite Pathway and are planning and or planning to be in a career and technical education program at Octorera or TCHS, then they are able to use the CTE Concentrator Pathway provided that they pass all three Keystone exam courses. So again, as, as it's listed there, students must still take the Keystone exams. They still must pass all three Keystone exam courses, um, the courses that they take that, that line up with, with the Keystone exams. But if they're not proficient in all three or do not meet the Keystone composite score, then the following pieces of evidence may be used to satisfy the state requ graduation requirement. Earning an industry-based competency certificate as part of the CTE program and passing all three Keystone exam courses will satisfy the requirements for the CTE concentrator pathway for graduation. In the event your student does not yet have an industry-based competency certificate by the end of their junior year, your student can also demonstrate a high likelihood of success on an approved industry-based competency assessment as demonstrated by performance on benchmark assessments, course grades, and other factors consistent with the CTE student goals and career plan as determined by myself in consultation with our CT program director, which is uh, Lisa McNamara. The, the determination shall be made no later than the end of the 11th grade, uh, or if a student enrolled in a one-year program, the end of the first semester of 12th grade. Or, 
your student can demonstrate readiness for continued meaningful engagement in a CTE concentrator program of study as demonstrated by performance on benchmark assessments, course grades, and other factors consistent with the CTE concentrator goals and career plan, and as determined by myself in, in consultation with uh, Ms. McNamara. The determination, again, sh shall be made, and I'm kind of repeating myself, being a little redundant here, but um, shall be made no later than the end of the 11th grade, or if a student enrolled in a one-year program, the end of the first semester of 12th grade. So again, this is a, another option, particularly if your student is pursuing that career and technical education pathway. Um, they can basically show their, their proficiency, if you will, through industry-based competency certificates, um, or the likelihood that they are also going to be uh, competent in assessments uh, in some of the industry-based um, things. So this is really uh, another opportunity for students that are pursuing that particular pathway. John, if I can interrupt you for a second, we've got a question in the chat. And the question is, can the composite path be used for students who opted out of a keystone due to COVID? Um, unfortunately, and, and I'm gonna take a stab at this and, and Jen and Karen, feel free to jump in, but the composite pathway only works if the students have taken all three keystone exams. Um, unless, I, I don't know, Jen, do you know if they just take, for example, two exams? I don't, I don't know if it's possible to get that composite score. Right, yeah, right. You absolutely have to take all three exams and get a numeric score in order to use the composite. So that, for some of our students that would have taken a keystone, for instance, during the COVID year, which was spring 2020, they received a proficient score if the, as long as they pass the Keystone course, but they will not be given a numeric score. So that automatically counts them out of the composite option. And then um, I guess I should also jump in with this specific question was like if a student opted out, um, there's no score granted, there's no, um, you know, proficiency granted. Uh, instead, the student would automatically move on from obviously option one doesn't work and option two doesn't work because you didn't take all three exams. So you're automatically forced to options three, four, and five. The CTE is option three and we haven't gotten to option four and five yet. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for your question, Julie. All right, I'm gonna move on to the next pathway. John, can I jump in real quick yet? Because now that I'm yes. thinking about it, since Absolutely. I coordinate Keystones, if, if you as a family didn't understand that at the time and would like your student to take the test now, meaning this coming spring in, the, in May, you can reach out to me because I'm in charge of the Keystones. Just send me an email, uh, jgerman at octorera.org and let me know that you're interested in having your students sit for the exam that they may have opted out of last year or the year before. And certainly we can administer that exam. So that if you are disappointed that you didn't realize that at the time, we can still remedy that now if you'd like your student to take it. All right, thanks, Jen. So the next pathway is the alternative assessment pathway. If your student does not meet the requirements um, for state graduation via the Keystone Proficiency Pathway or the Keystone Composite Pathway and is not enrolled in a CTE program, then they are able to use the alternative assessment pathway to graduation, provided that they pass all three Keystone exam courses. Again, just to differentiate, just to, to make sure that people are understanding when I, when I keep saying that provided that they pass all three Keystone exam courses, it means that they're passing the classes, but they didn't achieve proficiency in the, uh, the, the Keystone exam itself. For this pathway, students must attain one of the alternative assessment scores or better or successfully complete a pre-apprenticeship program 
or be accepted into a four-year college or university. In order for more students to have this option as a safety net, we will be encouraging more students to take the ASVAB. The ASVAB stands for the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery. It is a heavily researched and well-respected aptitude test developed by the Department of Defense. It measures a young adult's strengths and potential for success in military training. It is important to note that the district does not share ASVAB scores with the military unless your student is interested in serving. Again, I have to reiterate this point because uh, I know some folks would, would be a little concerned about us releasing ASVAB scores to, to the military. Perhaps you don't want your child pursuing that avenue or your child's not interested. That's certainly fine. We don't just uh, arbitrarily just release scores to the military uh, from ASVAB without your permission. So this is another unique opportunity for students to, uh, to take this particular assessment, most likely score at least a 31, uh, because anyone can take the ASVAB and score a, a, a 31. Uh, it's fairly simple to obtain, um, not impossible. If your student struggles to meet proficient on the Houston exams and is not interested in going to college, and is not a CTE concentrator, then this may be the best option for them uh, for, in order to meet the state graduation requirements. So again, this, this is the attainment of one of the alternative assessment scores or better. You could take the ACT and get a 21 or better. You could conceivably take the ASVAB, score 31. You could take the SAT uh, and, and score a minimum of a, a 1010. A three or better on each AP exams in math, literature, and science. Successful completion of a pre-apprenticeship program, as I mentioned earlier, or your child is accepted into a four-year college uh, or university. So the last pathway, uh, or one of it's, it's more lengthy here, is the evidence-based pathway. Um, if your student does not meet the state graduation requirements via the Keystone Proficiency Pathway or the Keystone Composite Pathway, is not a CTE concentrator, and does not meet the minimum required score on the ASVAB, then they are able to use the evidence-based pathway provided that they have passed all Keystone exam-related courses. For this pathway, students must have three pieces of evidence. One, two, or all three may come from the list that I'm showing you here. You can uh, get a score of 970 or better on the PSAT, attainment of a three or better on any AP exam, an industry-recognized credential, or acceptance into any post-secondary institution for college-level coursework. Again, they will always need three pieces of evidence. However, no more than two could come from the following, the, the list that I'm showing you here. Uh, proficient or advanced on any Keystone exam, successful completion of a service learning project, a letter guaranteeing full-time employment or military enlistment, completion of an internship or cooperative education program, or compliance with NCAA Division II academic requirements. So in summary, uh, Dr. How did you have something? Yeah, I did. Um, I just wanted to, before you get any deeper into this, I wanna address a couple of questions in the chat. So just to clarify, we encourage all students to take all three Keystone exams. Um, um, pathways, obviously one and two require Keystone exam scores to be at, at a certain level in order to use those pass pathways. Um, the CTE concentrator pathway um, provides an alternate um, um, way to meet those graduation requirements um, beyond the, the Keystone exam scores. Uh, pathway four and five, um, those pathways in and the CTE, so pathway three, four, and five require that 
all students pass the Keystone courses. So they must pass, pass Algebra One, Biology, and Lit and Comp. Um, so the juniors that couldn't take the Bio Keystone in 2020 and received a proficient, if you want to go the composite score route, um, yes, they would have to take the, the bio keystone again this spring. Um, the latest they could take it would be next December. And um, yeah, there is a disadvantage there because it's, it's, it's two years after the course. Um, but in, if you're going for that composite, if you're going for proficient or advanced on all three keystone exams, then you know if you were opted out and got that proficient in 2020, then you're, you're fine. Uh, I hope I hope that helps answer your question, Stacy. And then the other question I wanted to address was um, uh, were there tests held in December for students who did not pass their keystones? And that answer is yes, but I'll let Jen German elaborate on that. Yeah, so who we tested this past December uh, were the students that uh, predominantly had opted out in the spring because of COVID and other various reasons. They didn't feel comfortable coming into the building or what have you. So those students were offered uh, to take it in person this past December. Those that took it last year did not score proficient will be offered uh, the opportunity to retake it this May. So the thinking with that, especially with algebra and, and literature is typically you were in algebra one, you're probably now in algebra two, you're reinforcing those concepts throughout this year to be better prepared to take the test in May. Same with the English, you're doing those same concepts. It's really just the biology kids that don't have something that's reinforcing as much as the other two subject areas. So yes, those students, uh, especially those that scored basic and are, you know, are within reach will absolutely be given an opportunity to retake uh, the test in May. The other thing that I wanted to mention about the perk of having that second opportunity is the, the uh, state uh, does what they call like a super score. So every Keystone exam is broken into two modules. And when a student takes the test twice, they take the best module one score and the best module two score and put those together to come up with their new, uh, new score. And so a student that did really well in module one, not so good in module two, some students say, well, why do I have to take both? You can actually even improve your module one score even more to pull up that weaker module two score. Um, and they actually average those two together and come up uh, with a number and 1500 is the average that uh, is the proficient score. So I've actually had some students score so well on uh, the module one, actually did not pass module two, but when that got averaged together, it was over 1500. So there are a couple different ways that students can end up passing that. So we really encourage them to, to try it that second time and put forth you know, as much effort as they can, because a lot of times that second time they feel more comfortable with the test, they know what to expect, they know, you know, maybe some of the concepts to make sure that they review, and they're just more comfortable going into the assessment that second time. So we really do have, you know, many students do better that second time because of that super score option. Thanks, Jen, that's really helpful. And also I had a question um, in the chat about when we give the ASVAB or when do we recommend that? And um, I believe that is fall of junior year. Is that correct, Jen? So we traditionally have offered it in December every year and 10th graders can take it as a practice and then 11th and 12th graders can take it if they're really interested in the military because they're of the age that those scores would then make them eligible when they graduate. So 10th grade's the earliest, obviously seniors the latest, but that sweet spot is probably junior year. Um, at this point, thinking of it as an Act 158 assessment, that would be my recommendations if a student's interested in the military. If we're talking about this assessment for Act 158, it's again, probably junior or senior year. Uh, because we want to kind of see how they do on all three exams before they would sit for the ASVAB. So depending on whether they're retesting, 
you know, some of those subjects might mean it pushes it to, to senior year. So with this being so new, I think we as a school, we're still trying to determine, are we looking at junior year or senior year? Could even be both because you can take the ASVAB multiple years. Um, so definitely in the fall though, I think we would look to, to offer it because we need, for instance, if we're waiting till senior year, we would need those seniors to get that score sooner than later to know if they've met the Act 158 requirement. Otherwise, we've got to move on to um, the fifth um, pathway with the evidence-based. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep moving. Do we have any more questions, Dr. Tao, before I need to move on? Um, I just answered one in the chat real quick about students can take Keystone exams up to three times and they don't have to be in the same grade um, they were when they took the Keystone course. But again, the further removed they are, sometimes the more difficult it is, especially for the, the you know, for, for um, biology. So, but uh, I think that's all the questions at this time. So I think we can continue, Dr. Parker, thank you. Okay. Well, Can I I'm just gonna, throw? I'm gonna, go ahead. Go ahead, Jen. I just want to throw one more thing in there while I'm thinking about it. The Algebra One students do take it eighth or ninth grade. We also do have some students that split up Algebra One for Algebra One Part One in ninth grade and Algebra One Part Two in tenth grade. Students won't take the exam until they finish Part Two of that course. So there could also be some students in tenth grade that would take that. So I just didn't want anyone out there that you know, might have a student in a part one or part two of the algebra class to be confused. We wait until part two because we want to make sure they completed the entire algebra one curriculum before sitting for the exam. That's a very good point. Um, so how about I just sum up? Uh, basically, students have five options to meet the Pennsylvania state graduation requirements um, through the pathways of, of Act 158. These graduation requirements will begin next year with this year's junior class. School counselors have already begun tracking for the graduation pathways and have identified students who have not yet met the Keystone Proficiency Pathway and the Keystone Composite Pathway. School counselors will be meeting with those students to ensure that they have um, the required alternative assessment and or evidence to meet the graduation requirements through the other three pathways. As parents, you and your student will be notified if it's unlikely that your student will not be able to meet the state graduation requirement through any of the approved pathways. Please know that we will be working closely with, with your student to ensure that they have the support and the opportunity to meet the state requirements in a way that best meets your student's needs and career goals. Uh, but again, just to, 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 to reiterate, the five pathways that exist, um, simple and easiest way is just to pass the Keystone exams through Keystone proficiency. Uh, there's the Keystone Composite Score, the Career and Technical Education Concentrator, the Alternative Assessment, and Evidence-Based Pathway. So I'm going to transition. Um, if anyone has any more questions about Act 158, now is certainly the time to, to ask those. Um, again, and we'll, we'll say this at the end of the presentation, if you need to reach out to any of us that are on the panel, uh, whether it be Mrs. Letts or, or Ms. German or, or Dr. Jahal or myself, we would be happy to, to answer questions for you um, through email or another time. Dr. Jahal, any other uh, questions before I move on? Um, so um, I do have one question. Yeah, there's a couple of questions here. So let's just address those before you move on. So um, just to reiterate, um, Danielle, for your question, and no worries about popping on late, that's fine. We're happy that you're here. Um, if your uh, student was supposed to take the algebra keystone in eighth grade, if that was in 2020, then what PDE did for every student who was in a keystone course in grade eight, obviously they didn't take the keystone exam, but they, the state gave them, if they passed the course, then they gave them that, um, that um, uh, ranking of proficient, um, but there is no score associated with it. So they do not have to retake the Keystone exam um, um, that they were supposed to take unless they want to go that, that composite score route. And what that is, is, is all 
all the scores for each of the uh, three Keystone exams, if you add those together, they have to be, uh, I think it's a 44 of 52. So um, if your student looks like your student isn't going to be proficient on all three keystones, then that might be something you want to talk to your, your, um, your child's school counselor about. And then, um, yeah, Diane, um, the keystone exam scores and PSSA scores, the, the individual student scores with the parent letter, those just arrived in our office of, about um, keystone exam came about a month ago and we are just we are just finishing up and mailing out this week the PSSA scores from from last year they were they were delayed because the state extended the window into the beginning of this school year even though we didn't extend our window it delayed um everybody getting the information so if you have get that in the mail and have questions feel free to contact me or or um uh, your school counselor Uh, um, will parents be notified when guidance counselors meet with students to determine the best pathway? Will students automatically be signed up to retake exam exams that were not proficient? Um, Jen, I'm gonna let you respond to this. Sure, so regarding the students that uh, were not, did not score proficient automatically, we're kind of assessing how they scored, how close they were, how far away they were from reaching proficiency, and also looking at if we don't go with option one or two with the scores or the composite, what might it look like for option three, four, or five? What I would say is, uh, you know, for instance, if a student's a CTE student, that's pretty much an automatic for those kids. Um, I probably would not retest a student that scored below basic on an assessment if I knew that they were a CTE student or had one of those options um, that was probably more viable for them. If, if we know they're not a strong test taker and they score below basic on several of them and just aren't, aren't close on that, I really don't want to put them through that experience. It probably was already a negative experience for them the first time. We're probably not going to put them through that the second time. We'd start to look for another option. So like I said, if it's CTE, I'm automatically doing that for them. So it really just depends on how the student scores the first time that they take it and what their other options might be. But I would say probably at least 75%, 80% of them are yes, automatically going to a retest. Are there any other questions about Act 158 and the pathways at this time before we move on? <laughs> There's a question in the chat. Just to be clear, if a student does not meet the first four pathway options and does not plan on going to college, that student could apply to a four-year college, get accepted, and that acceptance fulfills the graduation requirement. Yeah, technically, but we would want to find a, a, a better way. Um, I would imagine that a way that's more relevant for that student if they're 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 certain they don't want to go to college. Um, and I'm sure that um, the school counselors will will work to find that um, because ultimately the goal is not to just jump through hoops, although it feels like it. And it can often feel like it when we we have state mandates. However. Um, you know, we want to find some relevancy in this. And I think the, the spirit behind this for the state is, is really college and career readiness and, and making sure that we have evidence to show that we're graduating students who are college and or career ready. So, and, and that's a good segue. We're going to talk more about that right now. Any other questions before we move on? Anybody have a hand up? No. Okay, I think we can move on. Right. And, and certainly, as you think of things, I know Dr. Perper said this, but please feel free to reach out. It's, this is a lot to digest in one sitting. Yeah, if you're not thoroughly confused at this point, I don't know if you've been paying attention <laughs> because it's confusing for us. And we've looked at this information probably uh, you know, 10 or 15 times. And, and for the counselors, it's been more than that. So. Um, it is, it's part of the deal. It's just part of uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Education. <laughs> uh, but 
uh, this is where we are. And, and again, we'd be happy to answer questions as we go along. So I'm gonna to transition to college and career readiness. Um, specifically, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the career portfolio and artifacts, um, and then dual credit and advanced placement courses. So in 2018, 19, the PDE required schools to demonstrate the college and career readiness of students by collecting evidence or artifacts designed to be proof of student engagement in college and career exploration, awareness, and planning. PD requires every learner to meet career standards benchmarks for career exploration, career acquisition, career retention, and advancement, and entrepreneurship, and complete a career portfolio prior to graduation. Octorary Area School District's graduation portfolio requirements and Navion's career benchmark ac activities meet this requirement. All students are required to have a complete career portfolio with artifacts from grades five to 11 by the end of 11th grade. College and career readiness activities are designed around the four career education and work standards categories and must be addressed at least once in the benchmark pieces of evidence. Ultimately, this is why your child is in school. The more we engage students in career awareness and readiness activities and connect their learning to career pathways, the better prepared they will be to make decisions about their future and the more opportunities they'll have to reach the college and career goals that they choose. So in the slide, we've outlined specifically the, the plan for um, the, the pieces of evidence that they need, and I'm make sure that you can see this. Um, in grade five, they, they need six pieces of evidence between uh, grades K, kindergarten to, to fifth grade. Grade eight, um, the benchmark is six pieces of evidence between grades six to eight, including indiv individualized career plans. And this is really met, I, I'll just speak a little to this, this is met uh, through some of the courses that they actually take in seventh and eighth grade. The Tech in the Futures course, if they have a Tech in the Futures course or if they're in the gifted program, there's also an opportunity for them to get some of uh, these, these artifacts completed during the courses that they take. But it's really about looking at career exploration during those particular times. And then the grade 11 benchmark, there are eight pieces of evidence between grades nine through 11 including two pieces of evidence that demonstrate career plan implementation. So I don't know if uh, this is probably a really good opportunity uh, for, for Ms. German or, or Ms. Letts to feel free to, to hop in here, but if, if there's anything else you wanna share about the career portfolio and artifacts, um, even and perhaps explaining some of the things that we have planned for students, but this is something that we, we definitely are working on, um, making sure that all of our students are acquiring the, the pieces of evidence that they need uh, to be put in their portfolio. So um, Jen, I don't know if you, you wanted to add anything to this particular slide before I move on to uh, more college and career readiness. Sure. So one key point I definitely want to point out is if any of your students go to TCHS, TCHS does require students to engage in these types of activities there. Students do not have to do an additional eight pieces for us at Octorera. We will accept all of the activities they do at TCHS and, and we're, you know, in, in um, conversations with them. So we're aware of the different types of activities they're having our students complete down there. The only thing is students must then enter that information into Naviance. Uh, that's a, a program that our school district has purchased to house these career artifacts. It also has many activities about career exploration, college searches. There's all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, but that's where all of this information has to be housed. So students will actually, when they log in, see activities specific to TCHS. And so we're in partnership with TCHS to know what those activities are, what grade levels they're offered, 
And then we um, just need the students to follow through and, and enter that information into Navion. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware it's not eight at TCHS and eight at Octorera. It's just eight total. We just need it to be in our uh, record keeping system, which is Naviance. Also, there is a question, um, parent of student moved in in ninth grade, they would not be responsible to make up everything from the grade five benchmark or the grade eight benchmark. They would just have to do the um, grade 11 benchmark. So I can also speak to Julie's question about like, the evidence. So typically the students are gonna engage in activity. So traditionally we've asked students to do a job shadowing. So they select a career, they contact someone in the community that does that career, they go and spend the day with them, see what they like about the career, what they don't, you know, maybe what kind of education it took to get there, just different information about, is this a career I would wanna pursue? What we then ask the student to do is log into Naviance. There will, there will be an activity there that they click on, you know, probably says, um, you know, sh shadowing one or job shadowing, something like that. And we use the um, different categories that Dr. Proper talked about. There's actually numbers assigned to them. And so we explain to the kids, you know, it, it's something that needs a, a point 11, meaning it's a, 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 a a high school activity. Some of the other activities are 0.8 because that's through eighth grade an activity. And then the four different categories, there are ones, twos, threes, and fours. That's that career acquisition and career exploration, those types of things. So students must have activities from each category. So we have those numbered. Um, and so I think the uh, job shadowing is a 1.11 because it's the first category for an 11th up to an 11th grader, and then it'll be job shadowing. When they click on that, there'll be a survey of questions so that they can answer about the activity. So when did they go and shadow? Who was the individual that they shadowed? What was the career? How does this relate to what you might wanna pursue you know, in your future? What did you learn about the career that you liked? What was something that you didn't enjoy about the career? We have specific things they need to answer so that we can show that they did the activity, but also what did they get out of that activity? So that would be an example of a piece of evidence um, that the students would have to put in there. There could also be, maybe they actually write a resume. They could then actually upload their resume. So it could actually be a document that they created through the activity. Otherwise, it's probably a survey where they're commenting on the, act the activity they engaged in and what they learned about themselves or about careers. Great. Any other questions regarding the career portfolio and artifacts? Yeah, there is another question. Are por portfolios tools to help them or academic requirements? So ideally, the career portfolio that our students work on and create is a tool to help them as they're making decisions about their future after graduation from high school. Sorry, we certainly don't lock students into the decisions that they're making. We understand that those can change um, even all the way up to the senior year. Um, but, um, but yes, those, those portfolios, while it's a, a requirement to, for us to have that and ha have evidence of that um, from the Pennsylvania Department of Education, um, they are designed to be, be helpful to students and, and that career exploration and, and planning, um, that, that, is, that is very helpful to students. I also wanted to add that, that all students are now required to take a personal finance class and some of the activities that they do in that class um, also uh, count as evidence um, for the career readiness benchmark. And, and that class is predominantly meant to be for 10th graders. So as long as we can fit it into their schedule, uh, they'll take it in 10th grade. Uh, occasionally it might not fit, especially if they're a career and tech student, um, it might not fit in their schedule, then they would be pushed to 11th grade. But yes, definitely a lot of the career artifacts for the 11th graders will happen in that 10th grade personal finance class. I think there was, oh, uh, there was also another question about with the COVID restrictions. We definitely were 
more lenient about that. So for instance, job shadowing was definitely an activity we uh, required students to do prior to COVID. Things still haven't loosened up at some uh, companies to allow for that. So we were lenient and allowed students to maybe um, do some kind of virtual uh, uh, shadowing or maybe a, um, a video of some kind about different careers. So even though uh, some of the activities on there probably are more specific to getting into the community and having those experiences there, there are plenty of opportunities that students can just do in their home without having to go out um, and, and, you know, have the potential, you know, of, of COVID exposure. If that's what somebody's worried about, there are plenty of other activities that they can search careers or do interest inventories, um, different things like that. So there, there are many opportunities not related to that face-to-face -face, um, contact that they may have in the community. All right, I'm gonna transition. Uh, we're gonna go next to speaking about college and career readiness, specifically the dual credit and advanced placement opportunities that we offer. Um, so for students who are setting a post-secondary goal that requires a college or university degree, dual credit courses and or advanced placement courses can do a couple of things. Um, one, obviously can expose the student to college level courses and the level of rigor that they will find in college level courses. And ultimately it provides opportunities for students to earn college credit while still in high school, uh, which ultimately will save on future tuition costs for students or parents. So let's talk a little bit about those in uh, more depth. <clears throat> Dual credit partnerships provide high school students the opportunity to take college credit courses taught by college approved high school teachers. Dual credit is for qualified students as determined by the colleges. In order to take a dual credit course, students should work with their school counselor to apply to the participating college or university. Students will also have, uh, have to take and pass a placement test provided by the higher ed institution. The post-secondary institution will make the final decision on enrollment. If your student is accepted and passes the placement test, then your student will be enrolled in both the participating college or university and Octoraire Junior Senior High School. Upon successful completion of the dual credit course, your student will have both a weighted high school credit to be used towards graduation and a free credit college course on a college transcript that can be transferred to the post-secondary college or university that your student attends. The best part is that it's free. It is the responsibility of the student to request a transcript from the partnering institution and send it to the college or university where they are accepted in order to transfer the credits. All du dual credit tuition fees are paid by Octorare Area School District. Octor Area Junior Senior High School in cooperation with Delaware County Community College and St. Joseph's University offer college courses at Octor Area during the school year, which include the courses listed on this slide. So as you see, there are a number of courses that we do offer um, through our partnerships with these uh, institutions. Um, they're, they're listed there. I certainly don't have to, to, to read that out for you, but um, uh, very, very popular for our students that are college bound that want to get a jump start on their, their college um, transcript. And it, it certainly has been a good experience for our teachers as well. So, um, a very unique opportunity to say the least. So, I'm going to get to the next piece, which is advanced placement courses. Octorera offers 12 advanced placement classes. Summer enrichment work is provided and recommended to be completed in order to be successful in the courses. At the completion of the course, all students are expected to take the advanced placement examination given in May of each year. The fee for the exam is paid for by the district. It is up to the discretion of the college or university to accept the AP exam scores as completed, um, as completed college level work. Not all colleges will do so, and it largely depends 
upon the program study to which your student is applying. Some schools will accept AP exam scores of three or better, while others only accept fours and fives. This particular slide shows you the similarities and differences between dual credit and AP courses. It's important to note that your student has a better chance of actually getting college credit for the dual courses, the dual credit courses they take versus the AP courses they take. However, some colleges and universities really like to see the AP courses on a high school transcript and weigh that more when it comes to acceptance. It is important to research the acceptance criteria for the colleges or universities that your student may be interested in and use that information when deciding between dual credit or AP courses. Of course, a student can always take some of both depending upon their career pathway. Ms. German, Ms. Ms. Letts, uh, anything that you'd like to add to this particular uh, topic as this is getting to the end of our presentation, but anything you wanna to share about dual credit versus AP, uh, I'm sure there will be some questions in the chat. I think you covered it pretty thoroughly. I think we found that um, one thing I would like to mention is that it's up to the student to request the transcript. If they complete a, a dual credit course at Delaware County and they're going to a different college, it's their responsibility to contact Delaware County to have that transcript sent directly to the college that they're attending. Okay. Yes, Diane, that, that, is, that is true. It, um, not all schools will accept the credits from other colleges, but um, I don't know, Jen and, and, and Karen, what are you finding with, with um, our dual enrollment courses and, and whether or not they're being accepted um, to the colleges and universities that our students have been applying to and where they've been accepted? Do you have any insight on that? We have found that um, most schools will accept the dual enrollment credits. Yeah. I think we found that schools are more open to accept the dual enrollment credits than the AP. Uh, that's Jen, what I, I I actually just had a student come in and, and switch. a. She thought she was going to do AP and she ended up switching to dual enrollment and um, because of the research she had done. So yeah, it's it, I think it's specific school to school. So um, research a couple, you know, I'm sure your student doesn't know where they wanna go just yet, but at least explore a couple different options and then just go with, you know, your best bet based on, you know, four out of the five preferred AP or dual credit or actually accept both. Um, yeah, yeah. It, unfortunately it's, it's specific school to school, but. I think most accept both, to be honest. In general, I, that's my vibe. I agree. And our state colleges, Westchester, Millersville, Bloomsburg, are really open to accept both, both AP and dual enrollment. And, and I think and some too, based on I see Diane's comment, um, sometimes the the college will accept the credit, but it might not be in that specific area, all depending upon what your child's going to major in in college. So if your child's going to, I don't know, major in engineering, uh, they might not want to grant the AP credit for a physics class or, or calculus class or something like that, but they might grant elective credit. So they're still getting credit for it, but they, but that college wants you to take their physics class or their calculus class. So sometimes there's even some nuance to that as well. And also I wanted to point out another scenario is, is, is you know, with the cost of, of college today, I, you know, I think I'm not a school counselor, but what I'm finding in, in my circles is that, you know, a lot of students are electing to do their first two years at a community college where tuition is a little bit less expensive, especially if they're undecided about what they want to major in or, or specialize in. And so if you get accepted to Delaware County Community College while you're still a student at Octorera and you take you know, those dual credit courses, you've got a jump start on, on you know, could be multiple courses with free tuition. So every little bit helps. 
Um, and there, there, are, there, there are multiple ways to, to kind of play the college game, so to speak, um, if that's the pathway that your student is interested in. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that the takeaway here though is this is an opportunity that we offer here. We're very proud that we offer opportunities for students to, to earn college credit while still in high school. Um, I just wanted to note that there are some students in their um, perhaps junior uh, or definitely senior year who have room in their schedule. So they elect to go off campus and take college courses at community colleges. Um, that is separate from, from the dual credit courses that Octorera and those courses, if they choose to take them, um, are not paid for by the district. Um, but that is also another possibility um, when you're looking at your pathway to college, if that's what your student is, is choosing. Um, but again, there are multiple pathways, just as the, we, we showed you there are multiple pathways to graduation. Uh, a four-year college is, is certainly not, not the only pathway to uh, a successful future. There, there are so many different options through our career and technical education programs um, at Octorera and TCHS. Um, going into the trades, um, going into um, you know uh, different types of post-secondary training. Um, I encourage you to to really explore all the options with your student uh, today because um, there certainly are um, so many more choices um, than there were when when um, um, even my my oldest, who is now 26, went through Octorera. A lot of the colleges that offer a dual enrollment directly with the college, like for Delaware County, they greatly reduce the tuition. Like if you take a course at Delaware County after you graduate from high school, it'll cost you over a thousand dollars for a three credit course. If you all take it directly uh, while you're a student, it'll be about two to three hundred dollars for that same course. And I, I would also add to that if your student is interested in taking those courses off campus, and when I say off campus, it could truly be you know, on a separate campus or online. There's more online options for that as well. There actually is a, a, a contract that we ask you to sign so that we're all on the same page of what course is being taken when and what high school credit is gonna be granted for that. So if your student is interested in those college classes that are not at Octorera, uh, make sure they're seeing their school counselor because there's definitely a form and a process that we need to go through. I see another question in the chat here. Um, so if your student is an OVA student, where do they learn about Naviance? I would imagine that, that Mark Katika, who, who uh, oversees and coordinates OVA, um, has a plan for that. Jen or Karen or John, or you have some information on that? Yeah, I would say it's probably something we're still in the process of trying to iron out. Um, last year, we were just swamped with the high volume of that. So we were really more concerned about credits and making sure your students were staying on track with that. Um, I would think this year, it's a point of probably trying to make an appointment with multiple students. I mean, when we go to schedule students for the following year, I know counselors reach out to the OVA students and set up like a Zoom meeting like this to do our presentation that with the students that are in the building, we're having those in person. Unfortunately, those aren't as well attended as we would like them to be. We'll probably do something similar to that with OVA and talking about Naviance and how they would do their career, career artifacts. Um, Thinking outside the box, if we find that that doing these virtual appointments with them doesn't really work, maybe there's a certain point where we have an OVA, a 10th grade OVA day where students come into the building for an hour and work with the counselors directly to do some kind of Naviance workshop. I'd like to see that. I don't even know if my, <laughs> if my administrators here are aware that's something that we've sort of had in the back of our minds, but. I, I think we have to get creative with it. So it's it's not a seamless process that we have set up right now. I think it's something that's in the works and I appreciate the question because it's gonna make us revisit that um, and probably even tomorrow uh, that I think it's something we need. To 
to talk about, but I know that's something I've had in my head. If we could coordinate that, that would be great if we could get the kids to come in. I just think it would be easier than trying to show them how to use an online program through a virtual meeting. That's just a extra there that might be difficult to explain. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, I think that's something we need to explore to have so that all, all of our students have access to Naviance and understand it. Uh, I also saw something, I, I think Crystal Lee noted that uh, should, should clarify the dual credit classes are free when taken at Octorera, but if students take dual credit courses at institutions, the student does pay. Um, that is true, uh, just to, to clarify. And we certainly have had uh, students that take uh, dual credit courses uh, or take courses, college courses, uh, and they certainly pay for them. Um, and but that's that's very important to to clarify. I appreciate uh, appreciate that. Looking at see I'll, what else. I'll I'll piggyback on that as well, just so families are aware. Like Mrs. Les referenced, Delaware County for sure does it at a reduced rate for high school students. But the thing you need to keep in mind is a lot of students and families, when they think about their students taking college classes, they think financial aid. You know, when we when we have them go on to freshman year of college, most students are taking out some kind of financial aid. That is not available to high school students. So it is something that you would have to know up front. You can afford to pay out of pocket um, if you're looking to do these off-campus classes. But again, Delaware County definitely does it at a reduced rate that you'd probably get certainly big bang for your buck. You could probably get two or three classes for the price of one uh, while, while your student's in high school but no financial aid available. Just looking to see if there's anything else. I don't see anything else. Uh, I, I just really wanna say thank you to all of you that took the time out of your busy evening to attend. Uh, hopefully this was informative. Uh, it's, I know it's confusing. It's, uh, as I said earlier, it's confusing for, for us as well. Um, it, it, it just is. There's so many different um, opportunities for students, but there's also so many opportunities for them to, to meet those state graduation requirements. Um, and so all the pathways do tend to get confusing. Um, we're actually waiting for the state to release a, a tool for us to be able to track uh, our students better in terms of what they what they have and what they don't have. Um, so we're waiting for that, but um, we really do appreciate all of you uh, attending this evening. And, and on behalf of Buckner Junior Senior High School, I thank you and um, just, you know, we, we please feel free to reach out to any of us uh, with additional questions going forward. Um, ladies, anything else that you'd like to, to share before we sign off? No, I'd just like to, to echo what uh, Dr. Prober said. We really appreciate you spending the time with us here this evening. Um, we wanna do more of this um, so that you have the information that you need um, and to make those important decisions together with your child for post-secondary planning. Um, and uh, again, if you have any other questions, um, we're, we're here, we're, we're happy to help and please don't hesitate to reach out. And I just wanted to thank Dr. Proper and Ms. Berman and Mrs. Letts um, for their time and, and their leadership in um, um, really navigating all of, all of this um, as it is a work in, pro in progress. All right, well, thank you very right. much. And we're thank gonna sign you. off. Have all a right. great evening, everyone. Have a good night. Stop the recording. Hey, everybody. Now.